Dr. Liberty Reforma. Dr. Reforma joined us from her training at the University of Pennsylvania, where she completed her residency after having gone to medical school at the University of California in San Francisco. And she's going to tell us a bit about fetal growth restriction. As many of you may know, um, SMFM has recently put out a um, document with some stand an attempt to standardize definitions of fetal growth restriction and potentially even some of the management. So Liberty is going to update us on those um, new developments and how to interpret um, the reports that you're getting from us these days. So Dr. Reforma, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Chloe. Um, so hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Liberty. I'm the third year MFM fellow at Beth Israel. So thanks for coming. And I'll be discussing fetal growth restriction clinical updates. No disclosures. One of the reasons for this talk today, like Chloe said, is to dive into what's new in the diagnosis and management of fetal growth restriction. And you might have noticed that in 2020, SMFM came out with new guidelines that expanded the definition of fetal growth restriction. And BIDMC implemented these changes in an updated PPGD in March of 2021. So the objectives of this talk are to review epidemiology definitions and etiology of fetal growth restriction, and to understand the emerging literature on the diagnosis. Um, in management of fetal growth restriction. To reach these objectives, we'll go over definitions and terminology, classification and etiology and management. So first I'll start with a case. Patient HR is a 30 year old G2P1001 with an EGD of 102821 by good dating. Her prenatal care was notable for a low risk early risk assessment, normal nuchal translucency and negative carrier screening. Her OB history is notable for one prior uncomplicated full-term vaginal delivery. <clears throat> She's a former smoker and fortunately quit at the beginning of her pregnancy. She did have mild COVID in May of 2021 and she also has ADD. Um, she was taking prenatals and colase and stopped Adderall at the beginning of her pregnancy. She was referred to us when at her um, full fetal survey at 21 weeks and four days, a growth lag was noted. Um, the abdominal circumference and femur um, were lagging by two to three weeks and echogenic bowel was also noted. She underwent an MFM consult given this early onset growth restriction and was referred to BIDMC for genetic counseling. And as I measured bef mentioned before, she had a low risk ERA um, and after counseling, she opted for NIPT, which was also low risk. Um, at BIDMC, she underwent a scan and no echogenic bowel was noted. Biometry was lagging again. Um, and so uh, I'll pause here and return to this case as we talk about management of fetal growth restriction, but I just wanted to introduce that and we'll go through it later. <clears throat> so fetal growth restriction occurs in 10% of pregnancies. The stillbirth rate in this population is 1.5%. And the figure on the right shows that peri shows perinatal morbidity and mortality in neonates with low birth weights. And the x-axis is birth weight percentile and the y-axis is neonatal morbidity. You can see that perinatal morbidity and mortality increase markedly as birth weight falls from the 10th percentile to the 1st percentile. And to further illustrate this, an infant with a weight of 2200 grams at 37 weeks has a greater morbidity and mortality at risk than one born of the same weight at 34 weeks. So moving on to terminology and definitions. You may hear that fetal growth, you may hear fetal growth restriction and small fruit gestational age being used as interchangeable terms, but they're not the same thing. FGR describes a fetus with an estimated fetal weight or EFW below the 10th percentile. And SGA describes a newborn whose weight is less than the 10th percentile for gestational age at time of delivery. And these percentiles are determined using different growth charts. So fetuses with FGR are not always SGA at birth. And SGA neonates are often not diagnosed as FGR in prenatal ultrasound. And so our goal would be to identify all SGA fetuses prenatally since morbidity has increased in this population. Estimated fetal weight is calculated using fetal biometric measurements. And these include head circumference, biparietal diameter, abdominal circumference, and femur length. And the accepted margin of error for fetal biometry and actual birth weight is 15%, but this can be affected by maternal habitus and fetal positioning. These separate measurements are then calculated into a composite estimated fetal weight using specific nomograms. One of the main changes in the 2020 guideline was the expansion of the definition of FGR. 
Historically, it included only patients with a composite EFW less than the 10th percentile, but now it also includes patients with an isolated finding of abdominal circumference less than the 10th percentile. And the image shown is an axial image of the fetal abdomen at the level of the stomach and intrahepatic portion of the umbilical vein. <clears throat> And um, with only one rib, rib cross section showing, and as a general rule, if you see the kidneys are too low. So why has the definition expanded? Um, I'll talk about the supporting data next, but the quick answer is that abdominal circumference less than 10th percentile alone has a comparable sensitivity and specificity to EFW less than 10th percentile. So as a reminder, sensitivity is the true positive rate or the ability of a test to correctly identify those that are affected with the condition. And specificity is the true negative rate or the ability of a test to correctly identify those without the condition. So this was one of the early landmark studies um, from AJOG to examine the diagnostic accuracy of abdominal circumference. David et al. studied 1,000 low-risk pregnancies who underwent a third trimester ultrasound at 31 weeks. And they used receiver operator characteristic curves or ROC curves to compare the performance of fetal um, abdominal circumference with estimated fetal weight as calculated through 24 different nomograms. And the incidence of birth weight less than the 10th percentile in this population in the study was 8.2%. As a quick stats primer, a receiver operator characteristic curve is a graphical plot that used, that's used to show the diagnostic ability of a test. And the x-axis is the false positive rate, or 1 minus specificity. And the y-axis is the true positive rate, or the sensitivity. And so what counts here is how much area is under the curve, or the AUC. The ideal curve is the blue line in the left image. And it fills in 100%, which means that you're going to be able to distinguish between negative and positive results 100% of the time, which is almost impossible in real life. And so the further you go to the right, the worse the detection. And the ROC curve that's green is due to chance only. And to the right of that is worse than just chance. And so an excellent AUC curve in real life is greater or equal to 0.8 or the red line here. The authors of David et al. created an ROC curve for abdominal circumference for the prediction of birth weight less than the 10th percentile and found that it performed pretty well with an AUC of 0.79. And I'm putting the example model that I just showed you to compare the abdominal circumference ROC curve to the example ROC curve. So it was pretty, it performed pretty well. And um, the authors then compared that ROC curve I just showed you to an ROC curve created based on the performance of 24 different established EFW nomograms. And I'm showing the comparison between AC less than the 10th percentile and the Hadlock formula here since Hadlock is co most commonly used. The Williams curve is another no commonly used nomogram, but it wasn't included in the study. And takeaways from this table are that the difference in diagnostic performance of abdominal circumference less than the 10th percentile and Hadlock as measured by the AUC is not statistically significant. And thus they perform similarly in diagnosing birth weight less than the 10th percentile. That study we just reviewed was done in 1996. And so since then, several additional studies on AC less than 10th percentile have been performed. So next, I want to talk about a meta-analysis of these many studies. Blue et al. did a meta-analysis of studies assessing ultrasonographic AC or EFW at, after 24 weeks to predict small for gestational age or large for gestational age at birth. And their objective was to compare the sensitivity and specificity of AC measurement versus composite EFW to predict birth weight. And that David study that I previously mentioned was included in this meta-analysis. This table shows pooled data of both low-risk and high-risk patients from these studies. And takeaways from this meta-analysis are that the EFW less than the 10th percentile and AC less than the 10th percentile, again, perform similarly to predict SGA with a much larger N. And in this case of pooled patients, they perform similarly, even when not taking into account risk stratification. And so I also wanted to point out that they also looked at AC less than the fifth percentile, but that has a significantly lower sensitivity and specificity. Um, uh, sorry, lower sensitivity, but higher specificity, and this makes it less suitable as a screening cutoff, but it can be helpful in confirming a diagnosis. From this same paper, this table shows the predictive value of AC and EFW less than the 10th percentile to pre predict SGA by population risk category as defined by the individual studies. And so low-risk patients were um, low-risk only if maternal or fetal conditions known to affect growth, such as aneuploidy, maternal hypertension, diabetes, and drug use were excluded. 
and high risk um, was designated if the study was designed to examine pregnancies with a specific condition that would predispose to a growth abnormality. And unselected was if they included all pregnancies in the study without regard to risk factors for SGA. And so as a reminder, positive predictive value and negative predictive value are influenced by the prevalence of the condition in the population. So in high risk populations, you would expect a positive predictive value to be higher, which we do see here. However, um, low risk populations in the study did not have a significantly lower prevalence of SGA than in unselected populations. These numbers demonstrate how positive predictive value and negative predictive value can change depending on whether a patient is high or low risk for a given condition. And predictive values can be helpful when we counsel patients. So these numbers may be especially um, helpful in our population, which is very heterogeneous. And the last study on abdominal circumference that I'll talk about is another meta-analysis that came out in 2020. This study is the most recent meta-analysis and included 32 studies on low risk or non unselected singleton pregnancies um, in the third trimester. And it was a comparison of the sensitivities and specificities of the performance of EFW and AC less than the 10th percentile. Found that these, um, these um, comparisons were non-significant demonstrating that EAC and EFW performed similarly. And so this is consistent with the findings that we've already reviewed in other studies, but just more updated. So there's some benefits of using a single AC measurement if you think about considerations um, from smaller, less resource units. It's less time consuming to measure and simpler to perform. And there's similar inter-observer variability, um, but isolated AC measurements should not replace detailed anatomic assessments or composite EFWs when they're routinely available. So classification etiology. Um, fetal growth restriction can be classified into early onset or less than 32 weeks at initial diagnosis or late onset, which is greater than or equal to 32 weeks at initial diagnosis. And late onset constitute the majority of cases. And thinking about classification helps to work through the differential diagnosis of etiologies for fetal growth restriction. Early onset FGR is more severe. Um, it tends to follow an established pattern of umbilical artery Doppler deterioration, which I'll talk about. And it also shows more significant placental dysfunction. Late onset FGR is more likely to have normal umbilical artery Dopplers. And if it is due to placental insufficiency, it's less severe. The etiology of FGR is associated with various maternal, fetal, and placental factors. Um, maternal vascular disease is associated with a failure to augment plasma volume leading to placental pathology. And this includes maternal diseases that have an impact on placental perfusion like preeclampsia. Chromosomal disorders and multifactorial congenital malformations are responsible for approximately 20% of FGR cases. And infectious causes, um, mainly CMV, comprise 5% of cases. Toxoplasmosis, rubella, and herpes also cause FGR, but are less likely to do so. And ACOG actually does not recommend screening in FGR pregnancies in the absence of other risk factors. So we mainly focus on CMV testing. Other causes include constitutional small size and placental factors, such as those listed here. And then I also included an other category that includes maternal nutrition. On an interesting side note, during World War II, a population of women in Leningrad who underwent prolonged malnutrition delivered infants with an average birth weight of 400 to 600 grams less than expected. And other things less that fall into this miscellaneous category include smoking, certain medications, and multiple gestations. This figure lists many more specific risk factors for FGR. So as you can see, there's multiple risk factors that can contribute to an individual patient's risk. Like I said earlier, classification of FGR onset can help with thinking through the etiologies of FGR. Early onset FGR is more likely due to chromosomal, genetic, infectious, or maternal factors. And late onset um, FGR is more likely due to placental insufficiency or maternal disorder, and um, also a constitutional growth delay, but that's mainly a diagnosis of exclusion. There are other ways to approach classification of growth restriction, but early versus late FGR is most clinically applicable. But another approach that um, many are familiar with is categorizing into symmetric versus asymmetric FGR. 
um, symmetric growth restriction um, is something that can begin in early gestation and is usually caused by intrinsic factors such as congenital infection or chromosomal abnormalities. And then asymmetric FGR is more common. Um, it's um, basically where the head circumference is preserved. And so then um, it, the normal size head appears relatively large compared to the size of the trunk and um, extremities. And it typically begins in the late second or third trimester. And this is more likely due to placental insufficiency. Now moving on to management. Once an FGR diagnosis is identified, it's important to confirm good pregnancy dating to make sure that the EDD is reliable. And for any new diagnosis, a patient should then be scheduled for fetal surveillance with weekly umbilical artery dopplers. And I'll get to the specifics of this in our PPGD in a little bit. And lastly, we recommend serial growth ultrasounds to monitor growth every two weeks. Management of fetal growth restrictions based on diagnosis, fetal surveillance, and timely delivery to reduce morbidity and mortality. However, these um, delivery decisions can be challenging when we are balancing the risk of prematurity against the risk of stillbirth. So in addition to being, being guided by maternal factors when making the decision for delivery, such as if a patient has worsening signs or symptoms of preeclampsia, timing of delivery can also be guided by fetal surveillance, like um, fetal surveillance, EFW cutoffs, and gestational age. So um, severity of FGR is defined as an EFW less than the third percentile. And in a retrospective cohort of um, US birth in 2005, that included over 3 million births, the risk of stillbirth based on gestational age and percentile of birth weight were described. And in this cohort, 96,825 neonates were less than a third percentile of birth. From this same study, this graph describes rates of IFD per 10,000 ongoing pregnancies by severity of growth restriction. And the x-axis is gestational age, and the y-axis is the rate of IFD per 10,000 pregnancies. And it divided all the pregnancies that were complicated by IUFD um, by EFW percentile, as you can see in the legend, and the less than the third percentiles in the lime green. Normally grown fetuses defined as greater than the 10th percentile at birth are described in the purple line. And then in all cohorts, the risk uh, for fetal death in FGR pregnancies was greater at all gestational ages than for non-FGR pregnancies but EFW less than a third percentile had a much greater probability of IFD with each advancing week of gestation. So as you can see, the rate of IFD is three times higher than the other percentiles. Of note, the threshold for severity of FGR is defined by lagging AC is not yet well described. Um, so that's an area of future research. So um, I mentioned umbilical artery dopplers earlier, they assess the resistance to blood flow from the fetal placental circulation. These waveforms provide an estimate of downstream placental vascular resistance and placental blood flow, which helps to identify pregnancies that are at risk for placental insufficiency. Um, umbilical artery dopplers have multiple different measurements, but the most important is the systolic to diastolic ratio, which describes the placental fetal circulation during contractile phases and during relaxation. Specifically, we examine end diastolic flow to determine the extent of placental vascular resistance. So box A shows a normal waveform, um, box B shows absent diastolic, end diastolic flow, and box C shows reverse end diastolic flow. And generally, once the dopplers deteriorate and um, persistently re show reversed end diastolic flow, about 70% of placental villus vessels are underperfused. A Cochrane systematic review, including five trials of over 14,000 patients, showing that routine umbilical artery dopplers in low risk or unselected populations with FGR did not result in increased antenatal, obstetric, and neonatal interventions, and there were no improvements in perinatal mortality. So just as a reminder, umbilical artery dopplers should not be measured in low risk populations in the absence of an FGR diagnosis. But umbilical artery dopplers do help us distinguish between constitutionally small fetuses and truly growth restricted fetuses affected by placental insufficiency. So using umbilical artery dopplers in the surveillance of FGR helps to reduce rates of induction of labor and cesarean delivery and reduces the risk of um, perinatal death. There are other um, Doppler measurements that you may hear about, but SMFM doesn't recommend them for routine use in the management of fetal growth restriction as they're not as beneficial as umbilical artery dopplers um, in improving outcomes. 
So these are ductus venosus dopplers, middle cerebral artery dopplers, and uterine artery dopplers. One of the other approach, approaches to management of, of FGR that seems like common sense is that there's specific guidelines for the management of abnormal surveillance. And this common sense is rooted in data from landmark articles. So the TRUFFLE trial is a prospective multi-centered unblinded management trial in 20 European tertiary care centers presented in 2005 to 2010. And it was created to evaluate a standardized approach to the care and delivery of, del of pregnancies complicated by FGR. And then the GRID study evaluated outcomes when non-standard antenatal surveillance and dis delivery decisions were performed in FGR pregnancies. So the truffle study was uh, included 503 patients with known FGR, and they were randomized into different management groups for delivery timing. So group one was uh, when delivery was based on tracing alone, specifically minimal variability. Group two was based on elevated ductus venosus dopplers. And group three was based on later ductus venosus doppler changes, such as absent or negative A wave. And delivery could also be undertaken based on maternal indication or other tracing abnormalities. And their primary outcome was fetal or postnatal death or severe neonatal morbidities. And so briefly, the outcome was 69% survival without um, severe morbidity. And in a follow-up study, there are more neurologically intact two-year-old babies um, in the late doppler changes group. And this was an example of a high-risk group being managed according to more formalized protocols than what was standard at the time. And in the GRID study, 548 patients at 24 to 36 weeks from 69 hospitals in Europe from 1996 to 2002 with FGR and abnormal dopplers were included. In these cases, there was clinical uncertainty about whether immediate delivery was indicated and patients were randomly allocated to immediate versus early delivery with a um, median of 0.9 days from randomization or later delivery based on provider discretion, which is a median of 4.9 days from randomization. There was no standardized surveillance and the outcome was neonatal morbidity and mortality. And interestingly, there were similar rates of neonatal morbidity and mortality between the immediate and delivered group, excuse me, the immediate and deferred delivery groups and there was no difference in two-year or school-age rates of neurodevelopmental disability. And so the lack of difference in mortality in the study suggests that using non-standard approaches perhaps allowed providers to be potentially delivering sick preterm babies too early without any clinical benefit. And so when comparing the two studies, the truffle and grit studies, it's thought that by improving antenatal surveillance as in the truffle study and a reduction in antenatal mortality might be achieved without worsening neonatal outcomes. So with that, this is the algorithm or guidance for management as outlined by the 2020 SMFM guidelines. And this was used to guide our PPGD. The beginning of the flowchart begins at diagnosis and classifies the FGR based on early versus late onset as we discussed earlier. Workup includes a detailed obstetric ultrasound. And if we're concerned about early onset FGR, a patient that should then be counseled and offer diagnostic genetic testing. This often includes a referral to genetic counseling for consideration of an amniocentesis to evaluate for chromosomal um, disorders. And a, piece, a CMV PCR can also be sent for infectious workup. Torch titers are no longer routinely recommended. And if a patient declines amniocentesis, CMV serologies can be recommended then surveillance should be pursued regardless of early or late onset FGR. And I'll talk about this in a few slides. Here at BIDMC, once FGR is diagnosed on ultrasound, the patient will be, just, will be scheduled for a growth ultrasound every two weeks, um, twice weekly testing, which can include an NST or BPP depending, depending on available resources. Once weekly testing, and this is all language from our PPGD, um, once weekly testing can be considered if the etiology is strongly believed to be constitutional. Patients will also be scheduled for um, weekly umbilical artery dopplers, which may be repeated more frequently if there's diminished diastolic flow. And then if absent or reverse diastolic flow develops, um, it's recommended to involve MFM as more frequent testing is needed and delivery timing will be individualized. So zooming into that algorithm, um, I did want to note that our PPGD recommends twice weekly testing with weekly dopplers for every FGR patient and then individualization once dopplers become abnormal. 
And this algorithm su suggests um, some slight differences. So I'll just highlight delivery timing here. With normal umbilical artery dopplers or an SD ratio less than or equal to 95%, if the EFW is greater than the third percentile, um, but less than the 10th percentile, then delivery is recommended at 38 to 39 weeks. If EFW is less than the third percentile or severe FGR with normal dopplers, delivery is recommended at 37 weeks. If there's decreased end diastolic flow, delivery is recommended at 37 weeks. If there's absent end diastolic flow, delivery is recommended at 33 to 34 weeks. There's also, prior to that, obviously, there's consideration of steroids, more frequent testing. And then if there's reversed end diastolic flow, there's a recommendation for inpatient admissions, steroids, frequent testing, and delivery at 30 to 32 weeks. I'm just bringing this slide back up to highlight our PBGD language specifically, um, as it really does become quite individualized as um, things progress. So just to go back to delivery timing per our PBGD, um, patients who have FGR with normal Doppler should be scheduled for induction at 38 to 39 weeks. If they have an elevated SD ratio or an EFW less than the third percentile, delivery is recommended at 37 weeks. And if a patient has absent or reverse end diastolic flow, delivery timing should be individualized in consultation with MFM. So back to the case, um, the patient and her husband were counseled on the findings of early onset um, FGR 21 weeks and opted to undergo amniocentesis. Um, the amnio results showed a fish and karyotype of a normal male, 46XY, with normal, normal chromosomal microarray and negative CMV PCR. She continued her prenatal care at the outside hospital and continued to get serial growth scans. And at 25 weeks, it was noted that she, the fetus remained small, but then also had intermittent absent and diastolic flow. So at that time, she was referred to BIDMC for beta methazone and inpatient admission, just given um, these findings, as well as the extreme early gestational age. And so at BI, she had her ultrasound repeated with similar findings, again, finding intermittent reverse and diastolic flow. She received beta methazone and continued monitoring on admission. Um, once that was reassuring, she remained admitted and got BID um, twice a day NSTs. Um, she was also evaluated for preeclampsia, of which there was no evidence. And then she received rescue beta methazone um, at, uh, a few weeks later. She continued to be monitored um, and got um, twice, weekly, or twice weekly testing with weekly Dopplers. At one point she had an elevated SC ratio. So she was admitted for quite some time, and she, um, and, but given that her overall stability and reassuring testing, um, she was ultimately discharged and follows, followed closely as an outpatient with three times a week testing. And um, fortunately she made it to 34, to 35 weeks because at her 34 weeks and six day scan, the fetus was still measuring less than the first percentile, but a new finding of absent flow on the umbilical artery dopplers um, was noted. So given this change, she was recommended for delivery via C-section given her severe FGR and absent flow on umbilical artery dopplers. She had uncomplicated um, cesarean delivery at 35 weeks. APGARs were five and eight with a uh, neonate measuring 20, 12, 20 grams. Um, and he still remains admitted to the NICU. Her placental pathology showed a small placenta, 322 grams, less than the 10th percentile. There was villus infarction, which constituted 10% of the parenchyma and um, showed uh, accelerated maturation, umbilical cord with hypercoiling. And so um, the pathology just noted that the findings suggested maternal vascular malperfusion, which supports placental insufficiency as the ultimate um, etiology. And so this was an interesting case of a very early onset FGR um, fetus that underwent, um, where the patient underwent extensive workup and ultimately delivery timing was individualized as the patient's course progressed. And so we thought it'd be interesting to note that since the implementation of the FGR PPGD stating these new definitions, we calculated the number of Dopplers performed at CMFM. These numbers haven't been recently updated, but just to note, we um, performed 537 Dopplers during fetal surveillance from March to June, 
Um, this is an increase from $231 performed from December to the end of February, and the new PPGD was instituted in March. Um, of course, there's confounding that exists with these numbers because everyone knows that overall volume increased during the summer months, but I don't have data to tell us how many pregnancies undergoing surveillance for FGA were ultimately diagnosed as FG SGA at birth, but that would be interesting to further explore. And in terms of FGR prevention, uh, many interventions have been studied, but none of these interventions have been shown to improve outcomes. And I'll talk a little bit about aspirin. I've outlined two meta-analyses of RCTs on the prevention of preeclampsia and FGR, and both are pooled meta-analyses of low-risk women. And there's some modest risk reduction, especially when used at less than 16 weeks. But as we know, low-dose aspirin can be used to decrease the risk of preeclampsia among women with risk factors. Um, but the data just hasn't um, been fully supportive of using it in, for prevention of the alone. Um, so thus far, ACOG recommends against the use of aspirin in low-risk women for prevention of FGR alone. When counseling patients, it might be helpful to know that there's a 20% recurrence rate in women with a prior pregnancy complicated by FGR. And the individual recurrence rate for each patient is related to the severity of growth restriction in the index pregnancy, and then also its etiology. So with everything we discussed today, I hope that this clarifies the recent guideline changes. And I think that there are several future research questions on this topic. Um, these include, does the diagnosis of FGR based on an isolated AC less than 10 percentile with reassuring EFW lead to improved neonatal outcomes? Does Doppler screening for AC less than the 10th percentile lead to improve outcomes? And if EFW less than the third percentile is considered severe FGR, what's the AC correlate? And lastly, I wanted to remind everyone how to find our PPGDs and then also highlight that there's an FGR PPGD and also a new um, outpatient antenatal testing PPGD. There was a new ACOG committee opinion on outpatient antenatal testing release, and we also have new guidelines for our network. And so this will be the subject of a future talk. So um, I'm just going to try and share and show you guys. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, I got to the PPG, PPGD screen from my portal and then um, went to this link here. It will show up here. The search um, function has been changed recently. And so what I do um, is go to advanced search and then fetal growth restriction. And you'll see the PPGD here. And this outlines basically what we talked about today. And then the antenatal testing one Antenatal Fetal Surveillance Guideline. Um, this was created by um, Dr. Duffy and Dr. Sudoff. And so this was based off of uh, the new ACOG committee opinion. And at the top is on fetal growth restriction since that was a change as well. And so um, this can be a useful resource for things that come up with your patients. Um, but this was just, I just wanted to highlight that since it was just released last month. Great. Um, so let me just go back to my PowerPoint. Great. These are my references. I'd be happy to take any questions. I see that Cassie's raised her hand. Um, Cassie, did you have a question? <laughs> 
or anyone, if there's any other questions out in the audience. Oh, I see a question from um, Bridget. Um, the patient case, she underwent cesarean. Would you ever consider induction for early onset growth restriction with any kind of abnormal Doppler? Um, so that patient was actually offered induction because um, she had otherwise reassuring testing and she declined. But in general, I think I would have a very low threshold to just go for a, a recommended cesarean delivery. Um, I think that would be like a very individualized discussion, um, but because most of the time these patients don't tolerate or the fetuses don't tolerate <clears throat> induction. And there is data that shows that um, an oxytocin um, contraction stress test prior to induction can help delineate which patients might be, um, which fetuses might tolerate labor more. So usually we start with an OCT and then go from there. But in that particular case, the patient, um, the patient declined. Um, from Dr. Loud, uh, what's the link to go to the PPGD page? Um, I don't know if others in the network have the portal, but the link itself, um, I'll put it in the, this is the link I have here, but I'm not sure that everyone, I put it in um, the chat, but maybe Kelsey, if there's a way that we can disseminate that link. I can try. Yeah. I'm not positive, but I'm sure it can be uh, made into a PDF just at least that specific policy. Yeah, yeah. Share it with anyone who is requesting it. Sounds good. Other questions? Thanks everyone, I appreciate your time. Feel free to email if any questions come up. All right, thank you.